Now, Jay is asking, well, in the fourth quadrant, and this is the area we go, the first quadrant or segment is the first five senses. You move the spoke over the second segment and or quadrant, and this is the interior signals of the body, our interoceptive sixth sense. We then move to what we call the seventh sense, our mental activities, emotions, memories, feelings, thoughts. Of course, they're influenced by the body. All these things are interconnected for sure. This is just a way of differentiating them, and of course, then they become linked. So those are mental activities in the third segment or the quadrant. Now, in the fourth quadrant, the fourth segment, since we're keeping the numbers going, the first five senses in the first segment, the sixth sense of the interior of the body, second segment, third segment, we're just going to name that seventh sense. We're just going to name this the eighth sense. So the eighth sense is where you become aware of interconnectivity. It's probably one of the most underdeveloped senses we have. And whether it's in families at home or schools or therapy or the media or what we do with each other just in everyday life, this sense must be cultivated in our human family or we are not going to have much of a future as a human family nor as life on earth. We need to deeply open this quadrant. So let's see what the question is, Jay. I'm just responding to that first part of your first question. While in the fourth quadrant, so this is bringing the spoke of attention to our interconnectivity, should we also focus on the space right around outside of the body? If that works for you, absolutely, because it is the notion of the body and then the body's connection to things outside of the body. So that would be fine. And later in the fourth quadrant, we're talking about our interconnectivity, like in a workshop we do, who's sitting right next to you, who's in the whole room, and then to your family, to your friends outside the room, to people who live in your neighborhood, to people you work with, um, and then expanding that out to all people in your city, your state, your country, all of us who share the earth, and then all living beings. That's the sequence. And so, yes, it's, it's, there's an inner mind. We have an inner self within the skin and case body, but there's also a self that's a we that's a part of this interconnectivity. That's the inter self. And, you know, we should have a big discussion, all of us. What are we going to do with this four letter word? Self because we start to other each other when linguistically we say, you know, the self is just this, my self is this, or I say my mind just comes from my brain. The mind is broader than the brain and the self is bigger than the body. So linguistically, we're kind of constantly lying to ourselves with this toxic lethal lie of a separate self. So even if we want to keep that word Tentatively, let's at least make a qualifying term ahead of it, like we have an inner self and we have an inter self, something like that. I know it's awkward. You know, I made up a new term that people seem to resonate with, we. We have a me and a we, and who we are in our identity is a we, M-W-E, and we're collecting from every language we can get a hold of people how you would say that in their language. So in Spanish, for example, we is yonos and we're collecting it, so send it into us at the Mindsight Institute. Um, but yeah, so, so it is about the body as a inner self. Let's start with there. And then your question is, and later in the fourth quadrant, should we feel our connection to the space around the earth, the solar system? Absolutely. We can go out and out and out as far as you want to go. And some people, of course, feel God, some people feel spirit, feel soul, feel all these essences that are different languaging we can get. Um, you know, and every day I do the wheel, I have a different sense of that, it's quite beautiful, but there is fundamentally beneath it, from the plane of possibility, this realization that literally, and I don't mean just this like, in some kind of figurative way, literally, we are each other. That we are just actualizations that emerge from a common pool of possibilities. So, you know, Jay, your actualization and this actualization are just emerging from the same generator of diversity. And that's a scientific way of describing, I think, where humanity, in terms of our cultural evolution, needs to go when we talk about expanding what Einstein calls circles of compassion, or what is commonly called expanding consciousness that with the wheel of awareness, we have this opportunity to distinguish hub from rim, to realize in the hub, 
that plane of possibility is the mechanism. And that's where we all find each other. And this is where we need to move as a human family. And thank you. Thank you for your question. When you start living from the plane, by the way, it becomes really, really fun. It's filled with so much joy, so much love, so much connection that sometimes you just shake, you know, where it's just like, whoa, this is incredible. And, you know, that is something you learn to both enjoy and also learn to live with because you also have to pay your taxes and stop at a red light. So there's, you know, there's all these uh, ways of doing it, you know. Okay, great. Thanks, Jay. The next question is, such great questions. The next person is asking, could you please explain the difference between the hub of the wheel and a dissociated state? Um, uh, hold on. A dissociated state for people with attachment disorders and have a history of dissociating. How is the hub different? This is such a great, great, important question. It's especially an important clinical question. And in The Mindful Therapist, that book for therapists and the book Mindsight, you'll see some discussion about this very thing. Um, I'll try inviting you on the screen uh, and we'll see if it works. I, I press it, but Christy, if there's something more I need to do, um, here we go, something's happening, uh, but I don't think that's what we wanted to happen. Um, so let's see if I can get back. Okay, um, so the idea here in dissociation, for those of you who are not clinicians, is there is a fragmented way in which the mind can respond to stress that in the field I work in, attachment research, we've demonstrated, at least for some people, is due to terrifying experiences that a young child has uh, that lead or are associated with dissociation. So um, it is possible to just enter pure awareness as a form of dissociation. It is true. But often that's done as a way of dealing with not feeling rather than feeling. So in a way, you know, and, and I teach sometimes with the wonderful teacher, Jack Cornfield, and Jack uses a term I know someone else invented, but I don't know that person's name, but called the spiritual bypass, where people can dissociate into meditative states that you might call non-referential um, awareness or, you know, objectless awareness, I think is what Krishnamurti called it. Um, and so it is possible to do that. In, in the wheel, you're almost doing the opposite. In the wheel, you're generating the capacity to sit in the hub and say to the rim, bring it on. I, I'm ready for anything to come in, which in a way is the opposite of fragmentation. It's deep integration. Uh, and you know, I'm doing some work with uh, a wonderful uh, graduate student now in this very question of is dissociation related to growth or is it related to a different thing that's not integrative. So that's what I would say is that you're probably getting a feeling that some people may use the hub as an escape and say, as one patient of mine once said, I, you know, I'm an expert at, uh, at meditation, don't have me review my memory. You know, um, I, I don't wanna go there, but when ultimately we did, there were all these very painful memories that he hadn't worked on. So that's why I would say in a way, it's kind of like, like the opposite. Um, it, it, it's certainly related to it and can be misused, but when you're open to whatever goes on the rim, not favoring one over the other, you'll see when we get to the mechanisms, how this is quite different. And let's bring Jay up. Jay is saying, um, is the self entirely imaginary and idiosyncratic? Um, Krishnamurti said that the self is all your fears. He also said that all the wisdom, all wisdom is self knowing. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I read a book by Krishna Krishnamurti and he said, you know, you want to know what the mind is, but I'm not going to tell you. Uh, so I love his statement. The ability to adapt to a sick society is not a sign of mental health. Um, but no, I don't think it's imaginary and idiosyncratic. I think, as I try to point out in the interconnected book, it, we can study how the experience of subjectivity, perspective, and agency, if we outline those three as the foundation of the experience of self are narrowed and there's an identity lens as we did in the beginning, you know, that gets very constricted. And then the self is not idiosyncratic, but it's culturally determined. And that's a process called self-construal that's studied by anthropologists. So um, yeah, I, I, 
you know, there's there's fear um, uh, and there's anger, there's sadness, there's core emotions that shape who we are for sure. Uh, but but what the self is is much more than that, I would say. 